a lot of new faces with us this morning, so I just want to kind of quickly recap where we are. If you don't know, uh, at Calvary 316, we believe it's by teaching the whole Bible that Jesus does a work of transforming us into a whole Christian, so then we can go out and reach the whole world. We believe in and bringing the changeless gospel in a relevant way to a changing world. So we teach the Bible here at Calvary 316. We pick books of the Bible as the Lord leads. We start at chapter 1, verse 1, and we work our way till the book is over, and then we start with another book. That's what we do here at Calvary 316. There's a lot of other churches that that do it differently. That's just the way that the Lord has convicted us, and the way we've modeled our particular ministry here. So we're currently in the book of Genesis Specifically, we're going to be picking up where we left off last Sunday, and that would be chapter 7, verse 17. And the flow of events, in case you haven't been with us. Genesis is an interesting book. Yes, it's true. It speaks of the origin of things. Yes, it's true. It talks about the beginning of all, of all things. The word Genesis literally meaning beginning. But beyond everything else, what makes the book of Genesis so important, the reason we're spending our time looking at the book of Genesis, is not just for the science, it's not just for the origins, it's just not for the cool story, to know how everything starts, how the Bible's stage is set. We're looking at the book of Genesis because the fascinating thing is that Genesis illustrates for us practically a concept that the book of Romans and Galatians present for us doctrinally. And that is this amazing concept of God's grace. If you look at the book of Genesis, there's no law. The law doesn't come until Exodus 20. There's no rules to follow, regulations to obey. As a matter of fact, every verse in Genesis oozes God's grace. We're presented story after story after story of individuals, men and women, that God uses not because of them, but because of God's goodness and his love and his grace and his mercy. And we see an example of this in the story of the flood. Chapter 6 opens with the world dark, darkened by sin, darkened by rebellion, darkened by the way of Cain. People who rejected God and established a society, a global society, apart from God. And things got bad. Things got dark. Things got depressing. Things became very wicked to the point that God was grieved. He was grieved, he was grieved <clears throat> excuse me, that he had even made man. Not in the sense that he regretted that, but that he was bummed out by what had happened with the man he had created. Things had become so wicked that a reset button would need to be pressed. And we're told in the midst of all this gloom <clears throat> and doom, Chapter 6, verse 8, but Noah. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That it was grace that found Noah, and not Noah who founded God's grace. That it wasn't based upon anything he had done. He wasn't deserving. He hadn't earned it. But it was God's unmerited favor given freely. God comes to Noah And he says that he's going to destroy the world in 120 days with a flood. Thank you. A flood. A flood of global proportions. A flood that would destroy all living things. Seven days prior to the flood coming, God tells Noah to to enter the ark that he had given them the blueprints to make. Noah did have a responsibility. God would save him. But Noah would would have to build an ark. And it's with all that in mind that we're told in verse 17 that the flood was on the earth 40 days. The waters increased and lifted up the ark. It rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth, and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole of heaven were covered. The waters prevailed 15 cubits upward, and the mountains were covered. Continuing, and all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man. All in whose nostrils was the breath of life, all that was on dry land died. So God destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing, bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth, only Noah and those who were with him in the ark, remained alive. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. You read through this section of scripture and you can't help 
But note the daunting phrase used four times in so many verses, and the waters prevailed. Aside from those who were in the ark, Noah, his wife, his sons, the animals that God had led, nothing, absolutely nothing, survived the judgment of God as God, through his word, presented. A reality was communicated that man's future would end with destruction, and it came true just as God had predicted. Additionally, this phrase, the waters prevailed, it's presented in the active tense, meaning that it would be better translated that the waters were prevailing. While the rain only lasted 40 days and 40 nights, the waters, we're told, continued to rise for a total of 150 days until, we're told, the mountains were covered at a minimum of 15 cubits upward. Clearly, this flood was global in nature. Now, while I want to be careful to take a, a detour that I would prefer to avoid all of the science that's related to the effects of a global flood, which, by the way, you should study on your own. This stuff is fascinating. But I do want to make one general observation concerning the effects of this flood. It is universally accepted in the scientific community that the general topography of the earth, and what I mean by that is the mountains, the valleys, the canyons, riverbanks, etc., are produced. Everything we see is produced in one of only two ways. It is either the product of what's called uniformitarian processes. That's kind of a fancy word of just saying that the processes inherent in all of the systems that we observe today have always operated in just a constant manner. So either everything we see is the byproduct of just the constant processes that have always occurred, uniformitarian process, or everything we see can be created, can be the result of a single or series of catastrophic events. It could be processes, just simple erosion, or things can happen as a result of floods, earthquakes, volcanoes, things of that nature. Let me give you an example of this. The uniformitarian view sees the Grand Canyon as being the byproduct of a slow cycle of natural erosion caused by the Colorado River. And it's because of the rate of erosion is seen as being mostly constant that this position yields the idea of dating. It provides a dating mechanism. For example, the Grand Canyon, because of erosion, as we see it today, this being a constant process, scientists conclude would have to be dated at somewhere around 6 million years. It's the way that uniformitarianism dates things. Constant process, normal processes, easy to date. That said, uniformitarianism is opposed by the idea that these type of typographical characteristics seen in the earth can instead be created instantly through cataclysmic events. It's fascinating to study in greater detail. But when Mount St. Helens erupted in May of 1980, the incredible force of the blast coupled with the hot gas, this cloud and the lava flow that proceeded to rush down the mountain at incredible forces, it instantaneously created, in a moment, the same type of canyons and fossil formations that uniformitarian processes require millions and millions of years to create over time. Like, understand, it is completely logical, and I will say scientific, to conclude that the Grand Canyon could have developed over six million years of the Colorado River eroding rock and sediment. That is the truth. But it is just as scientific to say, as Mount St. Helens illustrates, that something cataclysmic, global, could have happened to have done the same thing instantly. Like, here's my point. You can reject the notion that a global flood occurred 5,000 years ago. That's within your right. But you cannot reject the scientific reality that such a global event as described in the Bible with the waters actively prevailing 
would have been able to have created the same type of geolog geological archive we see today. Yes, it could have happened with uniformitarian processes, but it could have equally happened with a cataclysmic event. Personally, I believe, it's my conviction, that the geological evidence that we see today on the earth more substantiates a global event such as the Bible describes than it does the uniformitarian viewpoint. For example, how do we have such an extensive fossil record, which requires an animal be instantly buried with incredible temperatures and pressure almost immediately after it dies? Uniformitarians want you to believe that what ended up happening is that animals, because they're stupid, saw tar pits and thought, I'm just going to walk into them. And so they did, and thus we have the fossil record. All of them, massive amounts of animals, were just that stupid. Or you can see the fossil record as being evidence that something happened that contained high pressure and high temperature, that animals not only instantly died, but were instantly fossilized. And thus we had the fossil record we see. Just note, we have no evidence, zero evidence of things slowly being fossilized and instead only see this occur through catastrophic events like Mount St. Helens. Chapter 8, verse 1. Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped. The rain from heaven was restrained. The waters receded continually from the earth. At the end of the 150 days, the waters decreased. This phrase, then God remembered Noah. Understand what we have here, and I'm going to use a fancy phrase. What we have is an anthropomorphic Hebrewism. Meaning, what, what's not being communicated is that God had forgotten about Noah and his family. Like God can't remember, he can't forget in the sense of how we process God. We have a description of something occurring with God from just a human viewpoint. He hadn't forgotten about Noah. And then we get to chapter eight, it's 150 days into the process and God's like, oh snap, I totally forgot about that dude and all those animals on that boat. Silly me. Now, what's being described here, this, the word remembered, it communicates that it's at this point, 150 days into the flood, once everything had died, that God now decides it's time to act on Noah's behalf. That's what the word means and what's being communicated. So we're left to ask, how did God decide to act? Now that the waters had reached their peak levels, we're told the waters began to decrease as a result of three things. You can study these three things more on your own. We're just going to fly through them. One, we're told that God made a wind to pass over the earth. So the plan here is to decrease the waters. Three things God's going to use to accomplish that. First, wind. Fascinating. Unlike the pre-flood world, this is the first mention of wind and subsequently the first mention of any type of weather pattern. A great wind began this process of stirring the waters such that the waters would begin to subside. Secondly, we're told that the fountains of the deep were stopped. I refer you back to last Sunday's Bible study to get more information on the fountains of the great deep, other than just to note that some have speculated that with these underwater aqueducts emptying, the soil above them may have collapsed, causing deep caverns on the earth, which would have created the framework for our current oceans. Water begins to flow back into the basins, causing now the water to decrease. So there's a wind, the basins collapse, things begin to sink. We're also told that the windows of heaven were also stopped. With most of the water within a canopy layer that existed in this pre-Diluvian world now being emptied, the waters begin to stop, some remains, and we move forward so it stops raining. Let's dive to verse 4. Then the ark rested in the seventh month, the seventeenth day of the month, on the mountains of Ararat. The waters decreased continually until the tenth month, and the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. 
Now, now, admittedly, I just need to just pause and kind of let you know how the rest of the Bible study goes. I'm going to spend about the next third, maybe to the next half of our time, getting really geeky about Noah's Ark, where it is, etc. If that doesn't interest you at all, shame on you. Just kidding. You're just going to have to kind of bear with me for the next 20 minutes or so. I say that to say that there's going to be a juncture where we're going to end very applicational. So if we get into some things and you're like, what am I doing? Just hold on because we'll get to something that I think you'll find uh, applicational. None of what we're about to discuss is applicational unless you want to lead an expedition into Turkey to look for the Ark of the Covenant. And then, uh, not the Covenant, Ararat, but whatever. Let's just get into it. We're told, after the waters began to decrease, the Ark rested. Literally, it, it ran aground. And it ran aground, we're told, on the mountains of Ararat. Now, because we're told soon after the Ark rested, the mountains, the tops of the mountains were seen, it's likely the ark, as we're being told here, settled on the highest peak of a very particular mountain range. Now note, Mount Ararat is today located in north-central area of modern Turkey. Now there's two other points concerning this detail. First, historically speaking, Mount Ararat has always been <laughs> Mount Ararat which is important because there are some who have tried to make the case that looking for Noah's Ark in Turkey is frivolous because the Ararat of the ancient world was an entirely different mountain range somewhere in Iran. I can't say this more tactfully other than just to, to note that's nonsense. Like that's absolute lunacy. The Ararat we know of today is the same Ararat it's always been. The mountain had gone nowhere. Not only has Mount Ararat always been accepted throughout human history as the same mountain range we know it today, but you should know there is an abundance of extra biblical historical evidence to suggest the location of Noah's Ark has always been the Ararat of central Turkey. As early as the third century BC, there is record of a Babylonian high priest and historian, Barosis, who said that remains of the ark could be seen at his time. Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, writing in the first century, mentions the ark landing on the mountaintop of Armenia, same area, with relics still being in existence to his day. Beyond this, Nicholas of Damascus, another secular historian, of the first century, reported that timbers from a great ship rested at the summit of Mount Ararat. In the third century, St. Jacob of Nisbis, which is located on the Syrian-Turkey border, was the first Christian to search for the ark, Noah's ark. He claimed to have discovered a piece of wood of the ark that resides today in the Mitzedetian cathedral that's located in Armenia. Fifth century, St. Isidore of Sylvia, considered the last scholar of the ancient world. He wrote of the remains of Noah's Ark existing on Mount Ararat in his day as well. Again, in 1269, famed Marco Polo wrote in his journals of the existence of the Ark during his travels through Armenia. In 1829, Dr. J.J. Frederick W. Parrott searched for the Ark on Mount Ararat. He visited St. Jacob's Monastery in Aurora. He reported that that monastery housed artifacts from the ark at that time. Now you should note that that monastery was completely destroyed in an earthquake in 1840. It's now the Aurora Gorge. I think we have a picture of it. There is today a great mystery in the intelligence community surrounding an unnatural object sitting on Mount Ararat at approximately 15,000 feet. What's commonly referred to in the CIA as the Ararat anomaly began when several photos of a U.S. reconnaissance mission in 1949 showed, quote, a dense linear-shaped anomaly protruding from the permanent glacial ice cap at 15,500 feet. The Ararat anomaly, that's not something I'm making, it, making up. The CIA affirms it. That's their term. 
The whole discussion resurfaced again in 1973 when a CIA reconnaissance satellite took high-resolution photos of a purportedly, quote, boat-like object on Ararat while spying on Soviet missile installations just across the Turkish border. According to sources at the CIA, quote, a few days later, CIA photo interpreters in Washington were startled when they discovered in the high-resolution photos what appeared to be, quote, a heavily damaged bow of some kind of huge ship protruding out of the glacier during a major glacial meltdown. They at first thought it was a gigantic plane that had crashed into the side of the mountain. The problem is there was no records of a plane crashing on Mount Ararat, and no, no aircraft is that big. should also be noted that subsequent photographs were also taken of the same area in 1956, 1976, 1990, 1992, in addition to the 1949 and 1973 photos. All of these photos remain classified. None of them have been released. We know they exist. None of them have been released, and here's why. They contain covert operations of things we've been spying on that we're not supposed to be spying on, as well as our technology advancements, how well our satellites have been. And yet, in the late 90s, a man by the name of Portia Taylor secured the release of the original 1948 photos via a, a, a FOIA uh, request, a Freedom of Infor Information Act request. Last week, telling you I'm really geeky with this, um, I obtained several copies of the original photographs. They were sent to me uh, in the mail, the actual photos. Um, I scanned them, and I, I just want to show you a few of the photos. These are from 1948. We could put the first one up. Um, this is the original photo. Now you look at it, and you're like, okay, that's cool. Um, nice post-it note. Um, and yet, if I scan them high res, if you zoom in, you'll see what the anomaly is, which looks like a boat protruding out of a glacier. If you move on to this, the second photo, once again, another aerial. I zoom in, and just to give you another glimpse, that is the, the Ararat anomaly. That they have pictures of this. This is the source of so much controversy within the, the agency itself. The third photo, once again, another, another. You zoom in, and you'll see another structure. This is sit waves, ripple of waves throughout the intelligence community. Now, it's true. You look at that, and you can make the argument, well, if you're looking for a boat, that looks like a boat. But if you're looking for a rock formation, that kind of looks like a rock formation. They've done studies of people who uh, view photos for a living. 75% of them says it's a, it's a non-made, it, it's, it's, it's an un, it's a non-natural man-made object. Only 25% of analysts conclude that it's a rock formation. You're left to make your own decision concerning it. At c316.tv, uh, I've included a link where you can download uh, all the original photos. It's a zip file. So it's, it's difficult to decipher, I admit. However, the most convincing evidence as to the legitimacy of Noah's Ark potentially being the Ararat anomaly came during a Q&A that occurred at the Palm Beach Roundtable following a speech by Dr. George Carver, Jr., this was also classified. Uh, it was released in 2002, also through a Freedom of Information Act request by the blackvault.com. I've included a link uh, to those documents as well. Now, Dr. George Carver Jr., let me just give you some of his biographical information so you don't conclude, he, conclude he's like a Christian wing nut who has a slanted agenda. This is his biography. After graduating from Yale University, George Carver received a doctorate at Oxford. Beginning in 1953, he spent 26 years in government service, mostly with the CIA. From 66 to 73, he served three director of central intelligence uh, directors as special assistant for Vietnam affairs. After this, he was posted in West Germany, was the senior intelligence officer for the CIA responsible for Berlin. Note, that's at the height of the Cold War. At the same time, he was widely considered to be, quote, America's foremost authority on in intelligence and security. He is the only person in the history of the CIA to be twice awarded the Distinguished Intelligence Medal. Following his retirement, he served as senior fellow at the Center for St Strategic and International Studies in Washington. This guy has a resume. 
Now there's a Q&A, and here's the question offered by Porcer Taylor III, Dr. Carver. I am a West Point graduate, and while I was a cadet at the academy in 73, there was a strong rumor going around that one of our military spy satellites was flying down the Russian-Turkish corridor taking photos of a Soviet missile site and apparently accidentally took photos on the Turkish side of a large wooden object which appeared to be a ship stuck in a glacier about 14,000 feet on Mount Ararat. Strong rumors going around the academy at the time was apparently our intelligence people at the CIA might have classified photos of Noah's Ark. I was wondering if you had any comments about that. Laughter from the audience. Dr. Carver replies, well, I don't recall the CIA working on Noah's Ark. But I do remember at the time there were some photos taken. And there were clear indications that there was something on Mount Ararat, which was rather strange. There was various ar archaeological expeditions mounted. However, the Turkish government was not thrilled about supporting them because it was getting into an area that was politically dicey from the Turks' point of view. But that is but one of the indications you know uh, I haven't been there. I don't think anyone has, but it certainly was eyebrow lifting, and it was certainly an indication that despite its splendor as a work of poetry, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, might not be all that bad history as well, end quote. Now, after the exchange, Porcer Taylor was able to have a follow-up conversation with Dr. Carver, and he then went on the record explaining that there was uh, a conversation that took place at a director of Central Intelligence morning staff meeting around 1973, which Dr. Carver attended, that the deputy director of science and technology, a man by the name of Carl Duncan, you can Google him and learn about him as well, but he mentioned at the meeting of recent photos of the Ararat anomaly, and then there was a great deal of banter around the morning meeting about how, quote, the book of Genesis might be literally a work of history would love to have the photos declassified, and yet they haven't. Now, I can't say one way or the other if Noah's Ark is on Mount Ararat or not. I can't tell you for certain that those photos are Noah's Ark, that Noah's Ark's there, that Noah's Ark's waiting for you to discover it. But there are three things that I can say 100% for sure. One, the biblical location of the Ark has been verified by non-biblical historians. At some point, the ark was on Mount Ararat. We know that from the Genesis record, but we also have ample evidence throughout history of people knowing it was there, seeing it there, taking trips there, of there being artifacts from it. Doesn't mean it's still there. Secondly, there is without a doubt that there is some type of abnormality on Mount Ararat. It's a fact. It's been affirmed. That doesn't mean it's the ark. The ark was there at some point. Today, something's there. So you can reach your own conclusion. But the third thing I can say for sure is that there are obvious reasons why the Turkish government refuses expeditions to the location, as well as our own government. For the Turks' point of view, the reason that they have such a high stake in making sure it's not Noah's ark is that Muhammad said Noah's ark was on an entirely different mountain range. If Noah's ark is on Mount Ararat, there's a problem for Islam Turkey's run by Islamic government, thus no trips are allowed. Our government, hey, doesn't take a genius to say that if there's a boat on Mount Ararat at 15,000 feet, like there, there's implications for that, right? That that challenges a lot of preconceived notions by scientists who like to write God out of the plan that you have to look at and really reconsider. You can reach your own conclusion. I do have one more point, though, concerning the location of Noah's Ark. There have been some, as a matter of fact, a dear friend of mine, who have questioned whether or not it would be possible for the Ark to have survived 5,000 years. To this point, keep in mind, not only was Noah's Ark covered inside and outside with pitch, which in addition to acting as a waterproof agent would have also been a preservative, but if the ark was then soon later covered in an icial, a glacial ice cap, there's no question that the ark would have remained intact. Consider that today we're discovering all types of things from antiquity, much less resilient than wood, fully intact, 
as glaciers are receding from rising temperatures. We're finding woolly mammoths with vegetation in their mouth dating back thousands of years. A boat could survive. As a matter of fact, Norwegian archaeologist Lars Pilo, he writes that the ice is a time machine. That said, even without the ice, it would still be possible for the ark to survive 5,000 years. In 1954, an Egyptian archaeologist discovered a 4,500-year-old solar ship dating back to 2,500 B.C. made entirely of Lebanese cedar and the Giza Pyramid Complex. In 2012, another Egyptian wooden boat was unearthed dating back 5,000 years, a wooden boat, to the first dynasty of the pharaohs. So you take all that information and you just run with it, do what you want, or discard it. Let's continue. Verse 6. So it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. Then he sent out a raven which kept going to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth. He also sent out from himself a dove to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot and she returned to the ark to Noah for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. So... Noah put out his hand and took her and drew her into the ark to himself. He waited another seven days, and again he sent the dove out from the ark. Then the dove came to him in the evening, and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth, and Noah knew that the waters had receded from the earth. So he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove, which did not return again to him any more. So it came to pass in, in the six hundred and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, that the waters were dried up from the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and indeed the surface of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dried. We'll get to some of that later. But before we close, I do want to just challenge you with a simple question. What would you do if you knew God's judgment was coming? Like if you really knew like that God had revealed that revelation to you, maybe in some crazy way like his word. If you knew the judgment was coming at some point, you didn't know when, but it was on the horizon. Let me phrase the question maybe another way. What kind of impact should this knowledge have on someone who really believes it? In 2013, the Barna Group ran a poll where they asked this simple question. Is the world currently living in the end times as described in the Bible? Beyond the fact that 54% of Protestants agreed with this statement, and more specifically, 77% of evangelicals, in totality, this poll presented an amazing reality that 41% of all Americans believe we're currently living out the end of days. Kind of explains why we have the presidential candidates we do, doesn't it? Now, what I do find most shocking about this poll is the fact that 77% of what we consider our Christian community really believes today that we're currently living in the end times. By the way, I don't, but 78, 77% do, meaning the majority of Christians our brothers and sisters believe judgment is coming and we know how someone can be saved. With that in mind, I gotta be honest. I would kind of expect our current Christian climate to be a bit different. The fact that there's a majority of us to believe judgment is coming and we hold the keys to escaping that judgment, you would think the church as a whole our priorities would crystallize a little, right? And yet it hasn't, has it? This past week, that idea, I chewed on. I chewed on. Why is it that so many people, including myself, often act completely contrary to the beliefs that we claim? Like, why is it that we're so quick to say, I believe in A? but more often than not, my behaviors and actions tell a radically different tale. Well, I genuinely believe I love my wife. So often, I don't act in a way that's loving. 
Well, I can honestly say that I believe one and a half hours a week to plug into a church community is a small and reasonable time investment to foster my walk with God, with Jesus. That I believe I should go to church. Why, then why is it that, man, it's so easy for me to sleep in? Well, well I believe I should give 10% of my income or a portion. Why is it that I, I fail to do that? Well, I openly believe Jesus could call me home at any moment. How rarely is it that I allow that belief to dictate my daily behaviors and actions? Yes, I believe hell, hell awaits the unbeliever. So why do I shy away, cower from sharing my faith? Why do I say I believe certain things, but so often my actions don't correspond, that there's a disconnect? You ever feel that way? I do. I really do. Here's the brutal reality, the brutal conclusion I've come to. And it's that when your actions contradict your beliefs, there are only one, two, one of two conclusions you can reach about yourself. One, you never really held that belief in the first place. Or two, and I think this is more common, a greater desire superseded that genuine belief. Like, like, let, let me go back to my examples and, and explain how that plays out. When I fail to act in a loving way towards my wife, there are only two conclusions I can reach. And this is, this is brutal to swallow this pill. One, I don't actually love her. Or two, I love myself or something else more. It's true I love my wife. But if, if, if my beliefs and my actions, if there's a disconnect, it means that while I love my wife, I love something else more. Most of the time, it's, it's the ugly dude in the mirror. When I fail to attend church regularly, there are only two conclusions I can reach. One, I don't actually believe it's that important. Or two, other things in my life have a greater priority. When I fail to tie, there are only two logical conclusions I can, I can make. One, I don't actually believe giving is asked to me. Or two, I love my money and security more than I do obeying God. When I willingly engage in sinful behavior, there are only one of two conclusions I can reach. One, I don't actually believe Jesus could call me home at any moment. Or two, my desire to please other things, worldly things, has trumped my desire to please him. It's one or the other. When I fail to share the truth of Jesus with my lost friends and family, there are only one of two conclusions you can logically reach. One, I don't actually believe in a future hell. Or two, I care more about feeling awkward than I do the people I claim to love. So back to the original question. If I say I believe judgment is coming, but this reality isn't having an effect on my life, there are only two conclusions I can reach. And that is one, I don't really believe judgment is coming. Or two, greater desires are superseding that genuine belief. To this point, I want to play a video from a blog, a video blog posted by atheist magician comedian Penn Gillette. This video, it's a little grainy, um, but I found it to be inspiring and convicting all at the same time. So guys, if you would roll it. I want to talk to you about this. Uh, I get home from the show, and at the end of the show, as I've mentioned before, we go out and we uh, we talk to folks, and you know, sign an occasional autograph and shake hands and so on. And there was one guy waiting over to the side in the um, what I call the hover position. After I was all done, big guy, probably about my age, he had been the um, the guy who has uh, picks the joke during our psychic comedian section of the show. And he walked over to me and he said, um, I was here last night at the show and uh, uh, I saw the show and I liked it. I wanted, and he was very complimentary about my use of language and um, complimentary about, you know, honesty and stuff. He said nice stuff, no reason to go into it. He said nice stuff. And then he said, I, brought this for you. And he handed me a uh, Gideon pocket edition 
um, I thought it said from the New Testament, but I also thought it was Psalms from the New Testament, right? Or, uh, Psalms from the New, just part of the New Testament. A little book about this big, this thick, you know. He said, I wrote in the front of it, and I wanted you to have this. I'm kind of uh, proselytizing. I mean, he said, I'm a businessman. I'm, I'm sane. I'm not crazy. And he looked me right in the eye and did all of this. And uh, it was really wonderful. I believe he knew that I was an atheist. But he was not uh, defensive, and he looked me right in the eyes. And he was truly complimentary. It wasn't in any way, it didn't seem like empty flattery. He was really kind and nice and sane and looked me in the eyes and talked to me and then gave me this Bible. And I've always said, you know, that I, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that, uh, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. And atheists who think that people shouldn't proselytize, just leave me alone, keep your religion to yourself. Uh, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, but that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. And I've always thought that, and I've written about that, and I've thought of it conceptually. This guy was a really good guy. He was polite and honest and sane, and he cared enough about me to proselytize and give me a, a Bible, which had written in it a little note to me, uh, not very personal, but just, you know, like to show and so on. And then like five phone numbers for him and an email address if I wanted to get in touch. Now, I know there's no God, and one polite person living his life right doesn't change that. Uh, but I'll tell you, he was a very, very, very good man. And uh, that's really important. And with that kind of goodness, uh, it's okay to have that deep of a disagreement. I still think that religion does a lot of bad stuff, but man, that was a good man who gave me that book. That's all I wanted to say. Let me... Let me share that line again. How much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? Like we live in a culture that really keep your faith to yourself. Keep your Christianity in the doors of the church. It's never historically been that way. We don't have a faith that can remain in a building. This man just gave a Bible. Just went and gave a Bible. If you have friends that don't know Jesus, he, he makes that, that analogy that if, if you saw uh, someone where a truck was barreling down on them, and they didn't believe the truck was barreling down on them, but you saw it, like at what point do you then just have to go tackle them out of love? Man, that, that was convicting. And so I said, well, what are we doing? Like, what are we doing? And, and I, think, I think mainly, if we're not doing anything, but we believe it, the question, the exhortation, is what greater desire has superseded that genuine belief? Is it a love of the things of the world? Is it the security you find in that? Do you care more about being liked than seeing someone saved? Now, I'm not saying you can go out there and be a jerk for Jesus. That does no, that accomplishes nothing. 
But this guy just went and handed out a Bible, looked the man in the eye, told him his faith. Pin Gillette, you could tell, you could tell, right, that that had an effect. You could see it in his own eyes, his face. If we believe, friend, that judgment is nigh, judgment could come at any moment, and we believe that we know the way to be saved, why aren't we more bold and more active and more direct in sharing these things with the lost world around? We'll say this in close. I haven't talked to the elders about it. I'm sure they'll agree with me. If there's someone in your life that the Lord stirs for you to reach out to and you want to give them a Bible and you don't have the money for a Bible, the church will buy you a Bible to get to it. Like, if, if we have to make that a primary expense, giving away Bibles, then we'll do that. Elders, you agree? Yeah. I figured as much. Don't, don't miss the power of saying, hey, in this book are the words of life. The words in this book will change you from the inside out. And I'll tell you that because it's changing me. And I'd love for you to come to church with me because I go to a church where the guy's not up there promoting Donald Trump or railing against Hillary. It is not a political spiel. He ain't given his 10 steps for success because I'm looking for like one. I ain't got 10. But man, we just get together and we open the Bible and we let God say something. You should come with me. Be bold. Be bold. So, Father, Lord,